Welcome and thank you for joining this CME activity, Clinical Conversations, Pancreatitis Management in 2012, Recent Discoveries for Optimal Diagnosis and Treatment. I'm David Whitcomb from the University of Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Joining me for today's conversation is Christopher Forsmark from the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. In this activity, Dr. Forsmark and I will be discussing recent advances in the diagnosis and clinical management of pancreatitis. We hope that through this activity, you will be more confident and better informed about the care of patients with pancreatitis. Recently, there have been a number of advances in the understanding of pancreatic disease, and these have important implications for the care of our patients. Joining me today is Dr. Forsmark, who has brought a typical case that I think was going to be worth discussing. Thanks, David. Uh, I'm delighted to join you. I thought I might outline a recent case that I saw in clinic because I think it brings forward a lot of very challenging issues related to diagnosis and proper management. And maybe we can use that to, to formulate our, our, our comments about today. Great. So this is a young lady that I saw recently in clinic. She's 32 years old. She had been previously healthy, although she does have a fairly significant history of smoking. And about two years before I saw her, she developed an episode of acute pancreatitis. It wasn't really clear what the etiology was, but she did undergo a cholecystectomy under the thought that that might be the cause of her disease, and actually did well for a number of months, and then began to develop some rather vague but persistent symptoms of epigastric discomfort and some nausea. And so she was reevaluated and had a CAT scan initially which looked normally, there were the expected postoperative changes after cholecystectomy, but the pancreas and the biliary tree looked normal. And laboratory tests were also normal, with the exception that on a few occasions she had uh, modest elevations in serum amylase. That led to the performing of an endoscopic ultrasound, which was abnormal in that three features were seen, three of the nine that, mm -hmm. as you're aware, which was suggestive of chronic pancreatitis or perhaps consistent with chronic pancreatitis but not definitive. But in any event, she was given a tentative diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis at that point. And subsequent to that, the pain really began to worsen and become much more uh, uh, severe and persistent and uh, had a much more negative impact on quality of life. And ultimately, a decision was made to treat her with narcotics and gradually the dose was increased over time. Ultimately, that was not effective, and she actually underwent celiac plexus block on two separate occasions, neither of which produced significant symptomatic relief, and ultimately underwent an ERCP where the pancreatic duct appeared normal, but she did unfortunately develop post-ERCP pancreatitis. She did recover from that, uh, but the pain really continued. And when I saw her in the clinic, she was suffering from very severe pain, so eight out of 10, really. It was persistent, it was epigastric, it didn't radiate to the back, but it was worsened with food and also with some physical activity. And when I saw her, she was on enzymes, but she had required a, a fentanyl patch at that time and was also on an oral uh, narcotic. So when I saw her, we did perform some laboratory tests which were uh, normal, including pancreatic enzymes levels at that time. Serum glucose was normal. We performed an MRI with MRCP, which showed a normal appearing pancreas with a normal pancreatic duct. Repeated an EUS, and again, three features were found. I also performed a fecal elastase, which was in the normal range, greater than 500, and ultimately put her through a formal pancreatic function test which was abnormal, but slightly abnormal, with a peak bicarbonate of 75 milliequivalents per liter. So this is a kind of an unusual patient. I think if you were to read a textbook describing the typical patient with chronic pancreatitis, where you would see a patient with end-stage disease, with an atrophic and calcified gland, with intractable pain, this is a person who has pain, but doesn't have a lot of these other features of end-stage disease. And so it really makes diagnosis very challenging. And I brought this case forward to sort of demonstrate the series of steps that were necessary to go through to ultimately have some degree of confidence in the diagnosis. And it, it really, I think, focuses on two important things I, I hope that we can chat about. One is 
accurate diagnosis, and the second, which is, I think, equally important, is early diagnosis. And so I wanted to use this case as sort of a starting point, and perhaps we can refer back to it. Uh, this is the type of patient that I see frequently in clinic, the type of patient you may see frequently in clinic, and the one which I think produces the most uh, confusion amongst clinicians as to how to proceed with these types of patients. Yeah, so patients like this are, are difficult and not that unusual at a tertiary care center. I'm sure many uh, physicians in, in uh, more of a private practice or smaller communities also see these types of patients and uh, perhaps uh, do not refer them. But it really brings us to focus on the dilemma of asking the question, what is chronic pancreatitis? Uh, what is required for the diagnosis? And uh, how do you evaluate these patients that have a few criteria, but not all of them, but are clearly uh, suffering from some type of disease. I think that what you've presented gives us uh, some pretty clear indications that the pancreas is involved in the pathology that uh, she's experiencing in some way. And uh, it's difficult to pinpoint uh, exactly what that is. Uh, what are the types of things that really struck you about this patient that uh, made you think that was in fact the pancreas as the center of her problem? I think the clues that I found useful were that there was a clear-cut event that started the disease, mm -hmm. the episode of acute pancreatitis, and the rest of the symptoms followed that. I think we oftentimes think that acute pancreatitis is, is the end of the story and that patients recover and nothing else happens in the gland. But for most patients, I think, that develop chronic pancreatitis, there's some event early on that triggers the disease process, and it may or may not stop. As in this patient, I think it continued, but at a relatively slow pace. So that was helpful to me. The second was that the pain seemed to be consistent, at least, with pancreatic pain, and we had some additional information with the amylase level in the EUS that there was some abnormality in the gland. And obviously, a rather extensive evaluation revealed no other obvious cause of pain in that individual. But I think even in patients like this, you do remain a little unsure as to whether you've made the right diagnosis because we don't have a, a gold standard that we can rely on to make diagnosis. And so we combine a variety of clinical features and imaging features and functional features uh, uh, to develop sort of a picture of this syndrome and, and try to determine is that patient um, or the number of those uh, uh, points have they developed sufficiently in that patient that we are confident in labeling them with disease. I think the other thing that I've learned from managing these patients over many, many years is that for most patients, the early part of their disease is characterized just by pain. Mm -hmm. And the pain can be quite variable, it can be intermittent, it can be continuous, but it's characterized by pain. And for many patients, that, per that proceeds for months or years or even decades before a lot of the other changes develop that you might read about in a textbook. So they don't get diffuse pancreatic calcification, they don't get exocrine insufficiency, they don't get endocrine insufficiency during this long lead up of pain. And yet, if we have any chance of helping them, I think we have to identify them before they've reached that end stage. And that's, I think, the, the challenge in this case is, can we diagnose this young woman early enough to have an impact on helping her? And can we diagnose her, her accurately? The, problem, which I know we both wrestle with all the time, is that the, the, the easily available test to make a diagnosis, like CAT scan and MRI, um, usually don't become abnormal until later in the clinical course. So they, we're, we're in a bit of a bind where we have an a inherent um, you know, challenge in our diagnostic process that we can't overcome with current diagnostic tests. Yeah, I think you point out a couple important things. Uh, we're stuck in a, a dilemma now where we need a diagnosis to really direct treatment. And the diagnosis requires irreversible changes to the pancreas and morphologic changes or functional changes uh, to make the diagnostic syndrome. Clearly, there are a subset of patients that have something wrong with their pancreas and uh, they can suffer for many years with what we sometimes call minimal change pancreatitis because it's not all scarred and gnarled. Uh, these patients are not well. Uh, they're willing, in many cases, to have their entire pancreas removed 
and a islet cell auto transplantation to uh, avoid this pain. The second uh, problem that we've found is that patients that have a delay in effective treatment often develop a severe pain syndrome that is completely disabling and that uh, destroys their life, and that's really unacceptable. We need new ways of trying to make a diagnosis of the underlying uh, dysfunction or problem that is leading to these symptoms and be able to target therapy so that we can prevent the development of a disease that's irreversible and pain syndromes that are irreversible. We also, uh, thinking about this patient, uh, underwent a number of important uh, and expensive procedures like a cholecystectomy. Was that actually necessary and did that alleviate her symptoms? And I don't know the answer to that, but I question whether or not that was a worthwhile procedure. So these are the types of things we're struggling with in trying to move medicine forward and be more effective in the way we care for these patients because we don't have guidance for clinical decision making based on traditional criteria of, uh, of organ destruction uh, and, and uh, you know, classifying patients with uh, those type of criteria. You know, I, I, I want to emphasize that because I really strongly agree with it, this idea that um, you know, pain is a complex problem, and mm -hmm. uh, initially we believe that the pain is originating in the, in the pancreas, but in any chronic pain syndrome, these other, um, you know, there's neurologic changes in the central nervous system and the spinal cord that uh, allow the pain to persist even when you eliminate the original source of pain. And so when that pain pattern is fully established, um, we really have nothing else to offer, nothing we can do to the pancreas can, can affect that. We have to be able to act before that chronic pain pattern is established if we hope to prevent it. Uh, because once it is established, it's like any other form of chronic visceral pain. It's exceedingly difficult to treat. So this uh, patient that you presented is a, is a very good one because it does highlight a number of points. Number one, the patient was identified very early with an episode of acute pancreatitis. When that occurred, something changed and she began going down a process in which she had more frequent episodes of pain and signs of pancreatic dysfunction. The workups that were done uh, were equivocal in whether or not irreversible changes were there. And her pain continued, but the therapies that we've traditionally used to replace lost function did not change the process. So those are very important um, ideas because uh, if we had a better understanding of what the underlying etiology was and could change the natural history, perhaps patients have an opportunity to improve and, uh, and uh, not end up with uh, severe uh, chronic pancreatitis and disability.